we weren't. Oh. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, Adam. We decided that we should probably record this so that we can share it later. So I'm going to start that now. Sure. I, I don't think I've said anything important yet, so that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> you can just repeat it all. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So the the the, uh, the the screen time one is always interesting to me. The truth is that as a society, we weren't doing awfully well at this opportunity for kids to play outside. And 52 and a half hours a week was the average screen time for an eight-year-old to an 18-year-old um, prior to this. This is a four-year-old stat. In the most recent studies, two of them have just come out. The last year and a half, depending on which study you, you want to listen to, it's 75 to 95 hours a week is the average screen time for an eight-year-old, which is bonkers numbers now. I mean, that, that is now, we can, we can thoroughly say that we've, we've crossed a line that's, if you think about how important that sensory engagement is, that time is spent without any. So in terms of those things that trigger your memories, the things that actually make the information sticky, moving outside is starting to be seen as a real priority. The other thing that's interesting about the stats on this is the average distance for Rome for eight-year-olds, 10-year-olds, the distance they travel from your home or from uh, alone uh, has reduced significantly as well. I will put it to you that most of you, when you think of that favorite moment, most of you, I mean, I actually, I'll just ask, how many of you have a parent in that image of the favorite thing or an adult in the image of the favorite thing that you remember? Does anyone have a parent in that picture? So the average roommate, okay, there's one. And I'm going to guess right now, if you had a parent in there, usually the parent was involved with actively helping you to take risks. There was fishing or there was water involved. Uh, can I ask you, Tracy, just for one second? If you had a parent in there, were they encouraging risk or were they trying to pull you back from it? Encouraging. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's the norm for the ones who have the parent in the picture. We are seeing a very different society and a very, very different push now. And so with the average room rates now only being 150 to 300 yards for a kid, that my world was six miles. That was how far I went. I knew to move a bit closer because my mom had a bell and she'd ring the bell and that meant dinner time and I better be there for dinner. So I, I, I did come to sort of two miles by the time dinner was starting to roll around. So these changes, these significant changes in the amount of time now put pressure on the school to provide all of those inputs. The places where they gather start to really matter. And if you don't do this work, if you don't have the forest, if you aren't pushing them outside, if they're not having vestibular input and sensory input and, and proprioceptive input outside, if they're not having any of those things, then they generally aren't getting them at all. So your school has gone from, and your school grounds have gone from being a place to blow off steam to a place where they really have to engage all of those senses in order to, to gain the skills that are gonna serve them for the rest of their lives. So the work that you're doing now is way more important than it ever used to be. It didn't matter that my playground sucked when I was a kid, and it did. I had a steel rocket thing with like hard pan dirt below it, and it was brutal. And he's like the perfect thing to injure kids. If you have to come up with a mechanism, this would have been. But we met there to go to the woods. So we start to see that uh, uh, significant changes are happening in the way in which the stress levels are for the kids and, in, and increasingly in the way in which those stress levels start to hit the teachers. Teacher absenteeism is, is, is up over the last 20 years by about 140%. Those stress levels come because aggressive behavior rates amongst those kids go up the less they have a sensory experience in their lives. So you'll see those stresses start to appear in some of the other stats. And a fairly normal way, this is a Montessori school that we worked with, fairly normal way to look at playgrounds is to look at a flat plane that has a single thing for gross motor on it. Not really sensory, but it's a blow off steam mechanism that's quite durable. And when we're looking at these things, we're trying to think about how do we transform that exact same space, and this is three months later in the same space, to actually have an enriching series of experiences for those kids that involve not just gross motor, totally important, we get it. We have to have a place to 
climb and hands and feet and so on. And that's important, but equally important to that. And this is where the research is starting to come in from uh, uh, Tennessee and uh, Knoxville, from um, uh, Cornell in Ithaca, uh, there's stuff coming out of Winnipeg that's quite compelling. Um, the thing that you need is three other spaces are equally important to that growth motor piece. You need a place for quiet contemplative play. So that's a place where a kid can actually get away from running the gauntlet of your most physically able kids. You need to have creative dramatic space. So you need to have a space where those kids can actually do art or music or be creative purely in that moment. It might be theater. So creative dramatic play becomes important. And then the third one is fine motor. Equally important to the gross motor physical play is fine motor manipulating, touching, moving things. Those things matter. So one of my favorite things on this with the Montessori school uh, that we worked with was the, the, the email that I got. I got an email about a month and a half after we opened and the title of the email was we're having more accidents. And that's a very strange thing for me to hear because we've built 3000 of these now over the last 30 years and we have never had a claim for an injury ever. So the idea that they're having more accidents was kind of freaking me out. So I called immediately, I didn't even read the rest of the email. I phoned him up and I said, okay, you know, what's going on? What, what happened, what broke? What can we fix? You know, what's the matter? She starts laughing at me. The director was laughing out loud. And she said, uh, you didn't read the rest of the email, did you? And I said, no, you said this, had this terrible title that said, uh, uh, we're having more accidents. She says, no, 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 the kids are peeing their pants more. That's the, that was the accidents. It was like the best compliment I've ever received, frankly. So if you can engage a broader spectrum of kids in a sensory way, they stay longer, they're, they're, the bullying rates drop 87 to 90% right off the hop when you make these changes and move into those other three important things and not just purely looking at gross motor. And your forest is brilliant for this. The forest is the place that you wanna, you wanna be. And, and yet when we see the, the playground industry, they actually refer to these things at the top of this. That is their forest tree series, if you look in their catalog. I have no idea how that, that can be a thing, but, but you know, there you go. And we're seeing things come out more and more from this industry that fake nature. That is not the thing that my dad would say is going to help you with the macro microorganisms that are going to make your kid more resilient and happy and less stressed. And we're seeing that fake nature come up more and more and more often um, with different examples that look like nature. Um, the, sorry, this one was just, it's my favorite example of what not to do. Uh, but we'll see, we'll see like blue hippos and alligators and it's, it's not fooling anybody this stuff. This is a real thing, by the way, if you wanna look up a pooping elephant slide, this thing actually exists. It's not a Photoshop um, and you can get all of the angles. It, it is truly uh, awful, I can say without, without a doubt. But what's interesting about that is that if you actually move to the natural stuff, you get less prescriptive and you become more interpretive in, in the things that they can interact with, Matt, I, I don't know what you guys see in this. For me, I've, my problem is I've now seen um, a, a schnauzer in this thing, and I, I can't see anything but a schnauzer. I'm stuck. Uh, I've heard alligator. I've heard Chinese dragon. For some kids, it's where they find the bugs, and there's a whole lesson plan around those things in a simple rotten log. We have cleansed our sites too far. And it's taken away the opportunities for those kids to properly investigate uh, and, uh, and engage and be imaginative in their play. We're using these forms, these natural forms, very, very carefully. Again, our injury rates, people will look at this and think there's high risk. We're very, very careful about creating opportunities for kids to assess risk on their own. It turns out that when you look at the paper, written on outdoor risky play and where the injuries happen, the better predictor of injury is actually cognitive engagement during play. It is not the equipment itself or the impact rated surface below. If they, are sense, if they have their senses engaged, they are less likely to injure themselves. They become better at assessing risk. If their senses are not engaged, they're not cognitively engaged, and then you end up without that level of um, uh, of, of ability 
uh, to be able to assess risk. And there are other super important things. And the one that I like on this, if we were to measure one thing in every playground and, and we try to go back and do these measurements on every single piece that we work on, social collaboration, spontaneous social collaboration is a huge marker that we should be driving towards. Right now, if you're thinking about it, uh, um, what that actually means, by the way, is kids across age, gender, ability, culture, will all play with one another in a way that is collaborative without the input necessarily of us. So while they're at play and doing their imaginative play, it is a great way to score empathy on your playground. So you're looking for these little moments that happen. And if you were to think about a play structure, what you wouldn't normally see on that is a nine-year-old kid reading a book and a three and a half-year-old kid getting over to check it out an 11 year old kid getting ready for the jump all in parallel all playing side by side without conflict you wouldn't see that if you took away the sensory component of that gross motor play feature that's not a normal thing to see on those pieces and we see those numbers blow up as soon as we make it a properly sensory gross motor activity and yet what we usually start with and i think we probably pulled out about a hundred of this one in particular this was a popular one for a long time you see these things where we're trying to flatten out the property and we're trying to create a single piece of gross motor that's easily maintained. So on after for this, this is a different Montessori school that we worked with on this one. This is an after of the same space. Returning the grade, you have the glorious hill off to the side there. That is pure vestibular movement. That is a great piece to have that grade change will provide for that. We wanna have lots of different surfaces in these spaces. It turns out that 65% of the play amongst those kids will happen with what you do in the first 12 inches of the space. Anybody that tells you that one surface is the right surface is wrong by definition. There can't be one surface. If two thirds of the play is happening because of what happens in the first foot, the surface is your play affordance. So, it's super important to us to have that. And there's a whole bunch of other stuff that comes out of that in the nature play field if you start to have those different surfaces in there. The rules, frankly, suck for playgrounds. I'm not going to be subtle about that. The, the ASTM regulations around playgrounds and compliance suck. They don't have much to do with what is right child from a child development perspective. It's all about risk and it's written by play structure manufacturers. I have sat on those committees. Um, frankly, hours of my life I will never get back. But um, but but there's there's a important stuff that happens when you start to vary up the surfaces because outside of those um, regulations, what the certified playground safety inspector might look at are the borders that go in between every one of these surfaces. So you can get huge play affordance out of the things that aren't necessarily considered ASTM compliant play features. So furniture sits outside of this. Retaining walls and borders sit outside of that standard. We're still terribly concerned about the injuries. So what happens around those injuries on things like this is there is no statistical bump. And I have spent the time in the, in the research of this and writing the papers on it. There is no statistical bump in hospital visits for everything up to that first three feet of fall, regardless of the surface that you might have below it. So these things do not pose an added risk of injury, but they pose a huge amount of value from play affordance perspective. We're always looking at how do we jack up play affordance without jacking up your price for the installation, the amount of impact rated surface you gotta put in, the amount of supervision that you have to have in place. You wanna have kids be able to play and gather um, without having to worry about those big uh, um, injury worries. There's also stuff about maintenance on this. So you mentioned this about the forest and, and you know we're worried that it's, it's getting overused. There are certain little things that we've started to grow, to grow accustomed to doing. If we were to do a hill slide, for us, it's not enough to put a hill slide in. What also matters is that you know a few years from now, you still like us. In other words, we would want to have that hill not fall apart on you. So we have to plant it up. 
Because in order to get the, the friction coefficient to work on the slide, you need to have the slope a certain way, and that slope won't hold itself up unless you plant it up. But if we don't do these little wing walls, and this isn't to say you need to have a hill slide, but it's just to say it's important to think through the maintenance issues as well as the child development issues. And most of that maintenance stuff comes out of the patterns that the kids will follow when at play. If we don't put this wing wall up, which has nothing to do with any regulation anywhere, then in the first two hours, all of these plants are dead because they go down the slide and they bomb back up and they grab the, the material as they go up and it's all gone. If you put the wing wall up, now the pattern changes. There's more movement. They move around the outside of that plant material to get around your wing wall and then they go back down the thing. You're fully compliant, but you also end up a few years from now being able to look at those things as an added place for play. And you end up with plantings that survive. There's another whole thing around this because, you know, there's, and I'm sure you've, you've had this uh, conversation about how do you supervise kids when they're amongst all of the plant material? If you think about the way kids have been supervised their entire uh, lives, and those roam rates are a great indicator of that. They've been under the watchful eye of parents from the moment they've woken up. From the moment they were born until they are 10, they are pretty much supervised 100% of the time in, in you know, many cases up until they're, they're leaving uh, your care in, in the school when they're 17, 18 years old. It's important for us to set up plant material that still allows you to see through, that are ethereal enough that you can see through them, but you don't see their eyes when you're supervising. You see a leg, you see a body part, you know where they are, you can see through that plant material, but you're not seeing their eyes because if you do this, then they can't see you supervising them. And their behavior changes for the better when they're not seeing you supervise them. We still believe strongly in SEPTED, which is crime prevention through environmental design. It's a fancy term. The idea is the sight lines need to work so you know where your kids are. But we're going to strategically want to bring plant material in as buffers between different experiences in order to allow kids to, to actually feel like they are being given the respect to play and, 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 uh, and, and work together. These are a couple of the papers. The top one is the one I'm the co-author on, the, the one below my father was the co-author on. Um, the Helsinki Alert is interesting. Any of you have heard the, uh, the term uh, nature deficit disorder? Has anyone heard that whole thing? Okay, so that's a term coined by a guy named Richard Louv. The idea is that lack of contact with nature actually produces a series of health um, uh, deficits if you don't, if you don't have it. He's always been, he's a journalist who wrote the book, Last Child in the Woods. He's always said very, very strongly, listen, I'm a journalist. I'm not a medical person. It's not a thing. I just needed to call it something. And I, and I called it this, nature deficit disorder. Three years ago, the top immunologists from around the world, the Nobel Prize winners, I mean, the, the, really the top folks, um, got together and they said, actually, nature deficit disorder is a real thing. It is, if you do not have contact with the biodiverse environment when you're young, you will get a higher rate of Crohn's as a result. You will get a higher rate of um, irritable bowel disease. It is a better marker of type one diabetes than food. Having a contact with a biodiverse environment before you're 10 is a better marker of whether you will get diabetes later on than food. So those macro and microorganisms that you have access to have this massive effect on how you build your immune system, not just for your cognitive uh, 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 side and for, for stress and anxiety and that stuff, but, but significantly for what happens to you on the physical side as well. So when we're building these things for a group of kids of different ages, we don't just want to be thinking of the play, we want to be thinking of the rules, we want to be thinking of places to gather and how we're going to combine those things together. If you're looking at kids that are aging past playground age, 12, 13 years old, you talk to a 13, 14, 15 year old about, hey, do you want to go meet at the playground? They'll look at you like you've got three heads. That is, they're way past this already. So for them, social strata really matters. 
and creating the pockets that they might gather in and the sizes of the cleats that they would want to gather in is what will draw them into a space. And if you do it right and you vary it up enough, then parkour will emerge and different games will emerge and they will misuse this according to the ASTM regulations on, on playgrounds without creating risk of injury and still creating challenges for them as they play. Other parts that are important to think about, developmentally, vestibular motion matters. Swings give you vestibular motion. And why does it matter? It turns out you've got tiny little hairs on the inside of your ears, deep inside. And they need to swish back and forth a certain number of times in order by the time you're uh, uh, nine, 10 years old. And if they don't swish back and forth enough times, well, then you don't actually develop your vestibular system, your kinesthetic sense where your arms and legs are, your balance and agility scores essentially don't develop properly. Swings do a good job of that. So does rolling down a hill. So does moving back and forth in a hammock. And so does moving back and forth on a rope. Swings cost a stupid amount of money. And the reason they cost a stupid amount of money is because you need this massive impact rated zone in order to, to, to pass all of your codes. You can do this and achieve this by looking at ropes and things that move in a static play structure. You can get your vestibular engagement out of that stuff. So, and it also starts to bring up this other thing that, that needs to happen for kids, which is a, a place for graduated challenge. So as I'm looking at the kids that are showing up in the background, which I love by the way, um, the youngest one, so this is Sam and he's, he's just turn, turning four at this point. He was super happy that he got up on that rope and landed it, stuck the landing on the other side. Sue, who's 11, her big deal was getting the whole way across. Sam has no shot to get the whole way across this thing. The risk of injury is incredibly low and is managed by the fact that we didn't put a top tether across to make it easy for them to get all from one side to the other. You make it too easy, you lose the cognitive engagement, and then the impact on the rock actually goes up. The number of injuries goes up, not down when you make it too easy. And you have a broad age of, range of kids. So it's super important that we deploy graduated challenge throughout the things that we put in so that they work for that whole age set that you've got working for you at the, uh, at the school. Art's another big thing for us. It sits outside of the standard, but you can do great things with art. We have sculptors that we work with all the time. This is actually a bird blind that's wheelchair accessible in the shape of a bird's nest. And at this science center, I'm not saying you're necessarily gonna do this, but I just think it's kind of cool. They've now put a carrion platform. So there's a little platform just outside of this thing and they put roadkill onto it. I'm not saying you have to do it, trust me, but I just think it's cool. So. You can go into the bird's nest and from two feet away, watch as red tail hawks come down and feed on the animal on the platform right in front of your eyes. And there is something just great about those opportunities and honoring those opportunities as places for investigation for kids. We don't have to do it that way. Hey, Adam, you said yeah. interrupt if we have thought. I, I want to back you up just a little bit. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Like you can't, like I, your words weren't exactly this, but you were kind of saying like, you can't really build a playground that appeals to a team, but you can create something that they will use in a way that's challenging to them. Can you talk about like some of the ways that a team might use a space like this, even though it won't be like, they, I want to go out there and play. Well, I think there's two there's two things, and I'll actually thread, I'll thread it through the next series of slides then uh, as, as we go through it. So some of the stuff around art and gathering like this, this also doesn't comply. However, as a place to actually get together and gather, we're starting to build these things. Um, California Academy in San Francisco, we just built a series of different nest forms and arch forms in this way. So places where they can gather really matter. And I, I'll, I'm going to carry on through, but I, I'm going to I'm going to say that the pieces that, that seem to appeal, this is working with the material that was on that site. I happen to have a tree. We sent our carvers and built a slide into the side of the hill. I will tell you that there's a much broader age range that engages in this sort of thing. And if we made it out of plastic, it's for for whatever reason, 
narrows your age range of your kids. There's, there's also specifically, you know, we have like, we're like the island of misfit toys with a bunch of carvers who make cool stuff. So there's always things like this that we're, that we're pushing through that are fun. I will say, if you're ever going to do a, a, a carved slide like this, um, you, you kind of want to make sure that you're uh, not buffing it with ski wax. I figured this out the hard way. I thought it needed to go faster. So I buffed it with ski wax and it was kind of like shooting kids out of a cannon in the morning. Um, not a good idea. Turns out that a little uh, uh, um, a little bit of uh, friction is a good thing. I'm going to make sure, Melissa, that I do go to the, the conversation around the older kids because I'm moving through the age groups and I'm specifically going to get to some of that stuff as we move forward. I haven't forgotten about you. Um, I wanted to show this one because this, this is out in, um, in Michigan. And we worked with the local people there to produce different gathering spaces that honored the new trees that we were planting and actually saved those trees and produced opportunities for gathering and engaging. And when we were done and we had built a, a you know, a, 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 a stream for um, helping uh, a hatchery uh, for them as well, we asked the kids, uh, if we look, look at it, um, I guess it was about a year later, what their favorite thing is. And the truth is that half of them still pointed to the forest behind. And that we didn't have enough loose parts we didn't have enough stuff to engage and make in the place that we built. And we had to sort of jack that back up. So the loose parts, as much as we will be fond of the things that we make, the loose parts also have to provide some of what's missing. And as your forest gets used and used and used, we may have to start to replenish some of those loose parts, both in your forest and in the spaces that we create together. Things like sideways trees are both a place to gather as well as a thing to play on and there's a broader age range that they appeal to. While this is what it looks like for us from the engineering and the longevity side, this is what it looks like under the ground. These things have to still meet all of the, the, the conditions for compliance, but they need to be able to be a place where you can have five kids in their teens or five or eight kids who are uh, preteen being able to play on top of them. We will make more and more complicated versions of this as well and actually make them a bigger, broader, more interesting place to engage. And the more interesting that we do this, the broader that they are, the more kids start to use them in very different ways. You'll see a group of people gathering and hanging out. The truth is that the, uh, amongst the, the older teens, you can never win the arms race of getting them as high as they want to get in the year. So, if you get into this and you they, and, and a teenager say, I want to be able to get 10 feet off the ground, the next day they want to go 15 feet off the ground. And the day after that, they want to go 20 and you can't win. In terms of engagement, core strength and horizontal is actually a much more thoughtful way of presenting play opportunities. It is that parkour, it is that gameplay of moving across pieces that starts to become more engaging. So we often see groups of teens, and this is a, a broad age range in this particular school, moving from one end all the way to the other is actually a big deal and a big accomplishment for these linear systems. Linear systems seem to work better for an older age group. A younger age group will focus on sort of the vestibular pieces, but creating these opportunities to move the whole way across, as you start to develop the borders, as you can make the borders more fun too, you will start to see 18 year olds and 17 year olds moving from the border across onto this to stay off the ground the entire way. Injury rates, interestingly, once you get over six and a half feet, 87% of the injuries that involve hospital visits come from above that height. They are having the wrong kid at the top. So you wanna have graduated challenge where it's super hard for a three or a four-year-old to get to the top or even a five-year-old where the kid who has the ability to take the fall is the kid who can also handle moving across the top of the piece. So we purposefully do not make it easy to get to the top of these pieces. There is a group of kids who are interested in the physical play who will move the whole way across on the top of this piece. That takes a mad bit of, of physical acuity to be able to get there. 
And you can do that without having one interfere with the other. Um, I'm just going to move past that. I said something about swings earlier. It's not to say that you shouldn't have any swings, but if you're going to have swings, have it be something that you can participate with more than one kid. Think about how we can have five kids at a time, how we can actually make this more engaging and more movement and more vestibular and more interesting so that there's more to it than just a single swing in one direction. And your play will increase in the age range that you hit across the board will increase with that. In this particular park that we're working on, there's boulders and there's horizontal play and there's the movement piece. And we're seeing a lot of value across age groups and across ability range with basket swings that can both spin and actually move on a single axis in all directions. Much more engaging, lower injury rates, less impact rated zones that you require for those things. This is a, a for obvious reasons, called a giraffe swing that we've, we've uh, come up with. I hate this thing personally. I, I, I absolutely hate being on it because I don't know if you ever remember the octopus things. Remember that at the fairground? So the octopus thing, is on an arm and the arms all move around each other and then the individual ones swing and you, they swing up. And, and so this one really makes me nauseous. I can't handle it at all at this stage in my life, but kids will use something like this in a participatory way where there'll be two or three kids and they're both spinning this way and in that movement. And you'll have an age range of kids that, that is much broader in this. When there isn't kids playing on this, it's also super valuable because we're using, if you look at this, we're using the landscape around this to embrace the opportunities for kids to gather. In the background here, there's opportunities for kids to gather. Between the posts, people ask, why are these posts in there? Between these posts, you can put up slack lines. And those slack lines will provide both a social and a physical uh, activity range for kids that extends the play into another level for your kids. So you can vary the static equipment by creating an environment that you can start to hook up to. Ultimately, they're still going to be looking at us for what they can do in that forest as well. And I, and I just wanted to, I, I, th I was thinking about this picture because when I looked at the forest, it's starting to be a bit denuded. And I, I just think there is opportunity to start to bring back pieces into that. Christmas is coming. A Christmas tree drive where you cut all the branches off and leave them in the forest will actually be one of the most engaging things that you will do throughout the winter for those kids. There will be fort building and tools, that and bits of rope. You can see how the play can get jacked up again and it's no longer just sprinting and running. It's going to be focused play. It's going to be hands-on play. How can we look at some of the assets that you have? It shouldn't just be about the stuff we add. It should be about how can we jack up play affordance in the spaces that you've already got in place. We actually have a program in place. Sometimes insurers don't like these forts when we put them up and put loose parts. You can put big clunky pieces in too. Every Tuesday at the Botanic Gardens in the, uh, Southern Florida, every the first Tuesday every month is teardown day because then it's not a permanent structure and the insurance company doesn't have to make it part of their concern. So it's teardown day for all the local kids. Everything gets pulled apart into its pieces again and the rebuild begins. And every month it's a brand new rebuild. So opportunities for this, you're in a rare position to be able to take advantage of some of those opportunities if it's something that you're, you're interested in doing. When it comes to the surfacing and the types of things that we do, engagement in this will matter and will be dependent on that surface. This just gives you an example of the detailing of spaces when we're working in a space. How many different surfaces that can we get? How many different sensory opportunities that can we have? How much of this will create a game or give them an opportunity to create a game and how much of this is going to be non-prescriptive this works right across the age groups. This works for your youngest kids as they're crawling and learning to move, as they're cruising and learning to walk. And this also works for 16-year-olds as they're learning 
how to socialize and how to gather and who they want to spend time with, the more nurturing, the, the, the more sensory and varied the environment, the more nurturing it becomes for those kids. So the last few slides before we, we hop, in terms of the theory around this stuff, when we're looking at gross motor opportunities, we tend to bring them towards the same space. We wanna think as much about the buffers that go on between these experiences. So the experiences can be discrete from one another. So in other words, the A-type kid doesn't take over and blow it up for the kids who are just looking for a way in. And there's a group of your kids who just need a way in. They need quiet contemplative or to bring it back to that, that quiet contemplative moment and you need to be able to create these buffers so that the A-type kids don't make it so that the other kids are running the top. And if we're thinking about that, you end up with, this is the other side of the same school. There is a small water hole. There is a little shaded outdoor classroom. There are plantings and grasses and trees and seating. And there is a calmer side to the school and a calmer place for this stuff that is buffered from that gross motor area so that we're not interfering with the types of play, but we're honoring a place of mastery for every kind of kid. And if you look at the studies on this stuff, you'll see that 70% of the gross motor activity that's happening on a standard play structure is actually happening from only 30% of the kids. So 70% of your kids are basically getting very little physical activity if we only focus on that. If we start to split that up and honor the other types of play and gathering, your teachers will use it more as a place to teach and bring your curriculum outside. And your kids will automatically be less likely to, to sort of run ramshot over each other um, while they're in competition for the gross motor things. In terms of the behaviors, 19 to 22 minutes is a normal cycle for a gross motor kid. They will spend 19 to 22 minutes on a play feature that is purely gross motor before they cycle to the next thing. So it's really important that we create a series of different stations because that's the moment that the kids who don't wanna compete with that A-type kid have the opportunity to cycle in. So you need to have a series of these different opportunities so that you can see those kids cycle through and all actually have a, a place of mastery for each kind of play. Things I'll leave you with, um, we're a weird company. We have a bunch of weird people who work for us. I'm proud of that. Um, I'm a weird guy. I like chainsawing probably more than I like drawing or talking. Um, this is Dave. Dave is a Steinway Grand Piano um, restorer, uh, fully trained in Germany. He quit so that he could make these because he thinks this is more important and more valuable. Um, we're always interested in your ideas. We really are genuinely interested in the sort of artist I know, I've heard of Joe, I think it is, uh, who's got like this the crazy ability. So how do we intertwine the folks from your community to actually bolster all of this stuff? Because I think that's where the cool stuff happens, where it's more meaningful, where it's more important and people understand it. How do we involve your kids? Maybe there's an occupation or something that, that can fit together around this. How do we involve them in some way so that this has more meaning beyond just sort of plonking a thing in. And the thing I'm gonna leave you with is just, I know this is a, a weird map, but I just wanna put it out to you what's changed in the last couple of years and the sort of demands that seem to be coming our way right now. And I'm sure you're seeing it amongst the people applying to become part of your school as well. We offered up a free outdoor uh, learning environment um, at the beginning of COVID. And we offered up one, to all of North America. And we had 10,200 schools in two months apply for one. I had never seen anything like this before. And Something... we have another contest going on now. Oh, that's true. Yeah, yeah, we have another, yeah, we've another, got another one going. going. Um, so, but it just indicates that there is a huge change in the way people are thinking. We wouldn't have gotten 200 people to apply for this before COVID hit. Something has changed in the way people are perceiving this stuff now. Um, so, on that note, I'm going to uh, stop the share because I know I'm running at the end of the time and open it up if there are any questions, any thoughts you have or, or anything that you see and you think we're nuts and that uh, uh, whatever, whatever it is, uh, I'll throw it back to you guys. 
we are a little nuts, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> we definitely don't think you're nuts. And if she didn't tell you, Joe um, is a chainsaw artist too. So that's so funny that you brought that up, but I'll let other people talk. I just thought. Yeah, are there, does anyone have any questions about any of the, the research or the, the stuff that we're doing or, or ideas you have or, or thoughts you might have? And it's fine if you don't, because, you know, I'm all for going and just having a drink. <laughs> well, now that you say that, no, I'm just kidding. I just want to um, celebrate that, you know, I am sure that you have faced lots of uphill battles doing this work. Oh, yeah. And, um, you know, it is, uh, it is hard to go outside the green. And also, um, I feel like you're just spot on with all the things you say. And, and that you, you do, you, you know, your team does the work of, you know, not just trying to be cool, but the science behind it, the research behind it, right? You know, like it's, yeah. uh, it's holistic. And, um, you know, I'm just so excited about the whole thing. I just can't wait. I'm just like, gosh, why didn't we think about the Christmas tree drive? Darn it. You know, like all those things. <laughs> it's you know, we, have the, have... we have the whole email and the whole curriculum in a PDF ready to go. There so you go. if you want it, we'll send yeah. it to you. You put it out. That's right. You'll end yeah. up inundated with Christmas trees in January. Uh, yeah. But, you know, in a sense, you know, you get in this process of like tidying things up, you know, like and we, we forget about you know, the importance. And as we all walked out there, a group of us a couple of weeks ago, it was like, gosh, it's gotten so bare, you know, yeah. like, um, you know, we, we tidied up and or used or burned or, you know, like we, we, we just have to keep thinking about the rebuild part. So anyway, thank you. Yeah. I'm very excited. I think, well, I, I will say this about thinking outside of the box. It's much easier if you grew up never being told what the box was. Um, there, there, there's very little bravery in this. I didn't understand the other stuff. I didn't do well in school. I failed art. Uh, and, uh, and, and I would have been probably voted the least likely to have anything to do with education in, in the school I grew up in. Um, and yet me and the other misfit, uh, Tony, uh, I'm doing this and, and Tony is the chair of the Montessori Association of Canada. So um, we both would have been voted down by all the teachers for, for being involved in education. So, I mean, I, I think that the idea that I think the way in which our education has been uh, curated in North America, hey, um, Adam, there's, a, there's a lot to learn from you guys. Sorry, we, uh, someone asked me a question directly. They were having trouble figuring out how to send it to everybody. So I'll just ask it for them because I don't want to miss this parent's question. They said, um, do you have any suggestions on how to incorporate some of these ideas in your own backyard? And I'm sure you oh. can give a whole talk on that, but maybe you could give us a few. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, the easiest thing to start with, if you are looking at your own space, and it it'll actually comes back to that first conversation we had about the sensory um, uh, the engagement that we remember in the best of our memories when we were a kid. Look at your backyard and think about what senses are currently being engaged and bolster the ones that are not. You want to have... If you look out there and you think, well, there's nothing that they could manipulate with their hands, so there's no sensory or no touch or no fine motor, then think about how to bolster with that. If you don't have to build a climber, you could simply put in a, a series of cedar logs and planks or hay bales and planks into a yard, and that will be an endless moving, transforming play feature. It doesn't have to get you more than three feet off the ground in order to be hyper engaging. So um, water is always a fear. If we can figure out how to get just a bucket of water, some troughs, and they can be simple Home Depot uh, ABS pipe that you've just cut in half as troughs, those things will actually be endlessly engaging for those kids. I'm not a huge fan of just running the hose constantly. I would rather have a finite amount of water that they have to conserve and move because then they actually move with the water and figure out if there's a finite amount, they figure out how to be the water misers because that is the, the scent becomes the center of the game. So how can they move water from one side to the other? How can you drop off the loose parts that allow them to do that? Um, rope is a great thing. Planks are a great thing. Stumps as simple as that is, is a great thing. Um, the, the trick, if you're worried about kids sort of slipping off of some of these pieces to make the stumps wider than they are tall. 
you make them wider than they are tall, then they become automatically stable. So if you're worried about that, that at home becomes your, your trick. We like to chamfer the edges and sand them down and seal them. But if it's at your house, frankly, I wouldn't worry too much about that. There's no regulations around what you might do. But if there's one single piece of advice, it's always look at the five senses and figure out which one you, you are not doing a great job of providing opportunity around and then add those in. Once you get to the point where you got something to engage all five, and they can manipulate those things in some way, you know, you're going to end up with those kids out there for an hour, hour and 20 at a time. And you're not going to have to worry so much about whether or not you're there overseeing. Them. That five cents thing actually really works. It's a weird, you know, it's so simple, but I do believe that we are hardwired on an evolutionary scale um, to, to need to engage those senses. And, uh, and it, it is that lack of it that puts us up to no good. Great studies around bullying rates that have to do with this, aggressive behavior rates, um, focus and attention spans. You know, you pick your, your marker that you're looking for. It turns out math scores go up the more sensory the engagement is in the hour and a half before learning math. So there's, there's all kinds of really cool deep study on this now that was never there a few years ago. It all just backs up the same thing. Well, if that's it, then, uh, then, then we can roll. But if you have anything else that you want to talk about, I'm, I love this stuff. So I'll, I'll stick around for the next two hours if you want to just talk. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody. We really appreciate you joining us this evening. And, and if you think of questions that you're like, oh, shoot, we should have asked Adam that, just feel free to send an email to Melissa or wh whomever. They'll get it to us um, and, and we're happy to, to answer individual questions. So, or comments, if you have suggestions, we are all ears for, for something that you wanna see, so. Yeah, yeah. And, and if, by the way, one of the big things that we're into is this, um, lots of people have ideas and they're all welcome. The only thing that's super important to us is knowing why you had that idea. The thing itself is less important than why you wanted to do that. And that is true of your kids as well, because it turns out there's all kinds of really cool stuff that comes out of understanding why. You know, 10 kids tell you they want a tube slide. Well, it turns out when you ask them all why, eight of them just want to disappear. They don't care about sliding at all. Eight of them wanted the tube slide because they could disappear. So the disappearing part is the part that matters. So if, you're, if you have ideas, scribble down why that idea matters to you. And then we'll gather up the whys and we'll be able to provide a good design solution that, that sort of answers to that. All right, with that. Thank you so much. We appreciate thanks. you so much. That was fun. It was great to see you guys. <laughs> thanks everybody. <laughs>